Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. Yeah, 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 yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Psychology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science into your brain. I'm Ian Wolf on this vaccination edition from 2008. Martin Fashini and I look at the fear of the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine and how this fear contributed to the anti-vaccination movement. But first, here's vaccination announceables from Australia. Vaccines are very announceable. In August 2020, Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced Australians would get the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine before any order or promise of an order had been made for such a vaccine by the Australian government. It was an announceable. The AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is rated 60% effective against COVID-19 but it's cheaper to distribute because it doesn't need the very cold temperatures that other vaccines require. And it can be manufactured in Australia by the CSL company. In September 2020, the Prime Minister announced an actual deal to buy 3.8 million doses of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine to be available in March 2021, and 51 million doses of the University of Queensland vaccine which would be available in June 2021. This would mean Australia had a surplus of 30 million doses. Both vaccines would be manufactured by the CSL Commonwealth Serum Laboratories company in Melbourne. On the 5th of November 2020, the Australian government announced that it had an agreement to order 40 million vaccine doses from American company Novamax and 10 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine after those companies had finished their testing for safety and efficacy in preventing COVID-19. This meant the Australian government had promised to buy four different vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine contains a messenger ribonucleic acid, mRNA, that delivers RNA into human cells to instruct them to make the virus spike protein, so our immune system can recognise the virus. And the Novamax vaccine contains the actual virus protein, along with an adjuvant which enhances our body's immune response. The Australian government also promised to donate $80 million to the International COVAX facility for distributing vaccine doses to high-risk populations in developing countries. In December 2020, Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced that he's killed off the University of Queensland COVID-19 vaccine program because one of the ingredients in their vaccine can cause some people who've been injected with the vaccine to show a false positive on an HIV test, despite being otherwise completely safe. When the people who participated in the vaccine trial had a second HIV test, it came out negative. The Prime Minister claimed he cancelled the safe and effective vaccine program because of the science. But that wasn't remotely true. The Prime Minister's marketing people were unhappy. The frustrating thing for the researchers, for the people who trialled the vaccine in their own veins, and for anyone following their work, is that the presence of HIV and protein fragments was nothing new. From day one, the vaccine was built with a molecular clamp made from two fragments of an HIV protein. This stabilised the vaccine, but was completely harmless. You couldn't get HIV from this. Evidently, the Prime Minister and his marketers saw this as bad PR when they finally read the briefing after the researchers put in many months of long, hard hours of work to get a vaccine by the end of the year. If the Prime Minister had done his job and listened to how the vaccine was intended to work when it was initially explained to him, he could have cancelled it before it started if he felt it would look bad or scare the public from taking the vaccine. 
This is either massive incompetence or abuse of power, or possibly both. It would take the research team an extra year to engineer a vaccine that was stabilised with a different molecular clamp, and they aren't allowed that much time. At the beginning of January 2021, Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced that the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine rollout would be brought two weeks forward and Australians would start being vaccinated at the beginning of March 2021. The very next day, he announced that he'd pushed it forward another two weeks to mid-February 2021. The Prime Minister announced that the first groups to receive the vaccine would be workers dealing with international arrivals and quarantine, frontline health workers, aged care and disability workers, and those living in aged care or with a disability. The Prime Minister then announced that he wanted to inoculate 80,000 people per week, with the goal to inoculate 4 million people by the end of March. Sadly, the numbers don't add up. He'd need 89,000 people vaccinated per day, not per week, to reach 4 million people by the end of March. This means, if no other steps are taken, the Australian Government Vaccination Program will take seven times longer than was announced. And people over 70 years old, who are not in a nursing home, will still not have been vaccinated by October 2021. And the rest of the Australian population will have to wait until 2022. It's bad enough when the country is led by people who don't care for science. But it's tragic when it's run by people who don't care for arithmetic. Remember former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's take on mathematics? The laws of mathematics are um, very commendable, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced he plans that the first vaccine to be rolled out will be from Pfizer, which he hopes will be approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration by the end of January 2021. There will be enough doses to vaccinate 5 million people and will need to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. Despite not being part of the priority groups that the Prime Minister announced would receive the vaccine first, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the Health Minister Greg Hunt, Opposition Leader Anthony Albanese and Shadow Health Minister Chris Bowen will all be inoculated with the vaccine near the beginning of the rollout. To show confidence in the vaccine. This makes the Prime Minister's marketing people happy. So the Prime Minister gets the 95% effective vaccine, while the rest of us get the 62% effective vaccine later. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Should vaccination be compulsory or voluntary? From 2008, Dr Martin Fashini explains the history of the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine and how it fed the flames of the anti-vaccination movement. One of the greatest achievements of medical science was the eradication of smallpox, responsible for an estimated 400,000 deaths per year in Europe during the 18th century and 300 to 500 million deaths in the 20th century alone. Smallpox was one of the most feared and common infections you could get. Then in 1796, Edward Jenner discovered that by injecting material from a cowpox sore, a closely related virus, people could become immune to smallpox. He named his medicine vaccine, which is derived from the Latin word for cow. As a result of worldwide vaccination, smallpox became the first and only human disease to be wiped off the planet. Today, doctors recommend vaccination against a variety of diseases such as hepatitis A, B, polio, mumps, measles, rubella, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, chickenpox, rotavirus, influenza, meningococcal disease, and pneumonia. Most vaccines work by exposing the body to the very disease-causing pathogens that they're supposed to protect us from. However, the pathogen has been altered so that it can't cause disease. Picture a pathogen as a professional boxer. 
If you or I were to be put in the ring with him, we would be bashed immediately. However, vaccines expose us to a harmless version of that boxer. Imagine that he has no arms. Now when we get in the ring, we can get close and find out what his weaknesses are. Then, if we find ourselves back in the ring with a fully armed boxer, we would know how to knock him out. Maybe you or I wouldn't be able to knock out Mike Tyson if we knew his weaknesses, but our immune system is a different story. Our immune system is the undisputed heavyweight champion, capable of winning almost any fight as long as we've had a chance to study our opponent and find his weaknesses. So, with the eradication of smallpox, the near elimination of polio, and the protection offered against terrible modern diseases such as hepatitis, pneumonia, and measles, it is perhaps a bit surprising to find out how many people are choosing not to have their children immunized. Many parents today believe that the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine increases the risk of autism in children. This vaccine is given in two doses to children under the age of two. The three vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella are given together to reduce the number of times that the child needs to visit their doctor and reduce the associated stress with injections. Autism refers to a spectrum of neurodevelopmental disorders that are poorly understood. Children affected with autism show impaired social development and communication. They often exhibit restrictive and repetitive behavior. Many parts of the brain are affected, and few children with autism live independently once they reach adulthood. Autism has a strong genetic basis, but the genes involved and the mechanism are still not understood. Currently, there is no cure. One of the reasons many parents associate autism with the vaccine is that the rates of autism have been rising alarmingly fast over the past 20 years. This rise is very loosely associated with the introduction of the MMR vaccine, and many parents first notice symptoms in their child soon after they're vaccinated. Today, much of the controversy surrounding the link between the MMR vaccine and autism stems from a 1998 scientific study published in the prestigious British medical journal, The Lancet. A group led by Dr. Andrew Wakefield, a surgeon at the Royal Free Hospital in London, studied a group of 12 children with neurodevelopmental disorders. The parents of eight of the children reported that their symptoms had begun soon after the MMR vaccination. The children also suffered from gastrointestinal symptoms. The study concluded that there was a relationship between the gastrointestinal symptoms and the autism. This would have been a new finding. Importantly, the paper said it suggested, but did not prove a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Wakefield suggested giving vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella individually, saying, I can't support the continued use of these three vaccines in combination until this issue has been resolved. The hospital issued a video news release to major broadcasters where Wakefield called for the MMR vaccine to be suspended in favor of the single vaccines. However, these suggestions were not supported by the 12 co-authors of the study, nor any scientific evidence. The subsequent news conference where the results were announced and the ensuing media coverage caused a major health scare in England. The public's faith in the vaccine was destroyed, and some parents of autistic children were both furious and relieved that their observations were being taken seriously by the medical community. However, Dr. Wakefield received an immense amount of criticism. Many of the paper's co-authors were confused at Wakefield's conclusions because they saw insufficient evidence. Also, evidence of unethical behavior by three of the study's authors, including Wakefield, began to emerge. It is alleged that Wakefield himself accepted over 800,000 Australian dollars by British lawyers who were attempting to prove that the MMR vaccine was dangerous. This was two years before the Lancet article was published. He also filed for a patent on individual vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella, and failed to disclose this to the editors of The Lancet. It is also alleged that Dr. Wakefield performed procedures on the children without the necessary pediatric training and outside the scope of his position in the hospital. In addition, Wakefield abused his position of trust as a doctor by taking children's blood samples at a birthday party and offering money in exchange. The three doctors are also being investigated by the medical board because they failed to apply for and receive the necessary approval from the ethics committee to perform the study. However, they did tell The Lancet that the approval was given. The editors have since stated that had they been aware of these conflicts of interest, the publication would never have proceeded as it did. The medical board also alleges that some of the children did not qualify for the study based on their behavioral symptoms and that they were subject to unnecessary procedures, including colonoscopies and lumbar punctures. The Medical Council had its hearing of these offenses from July 15th to July 18th of this year. If Wakefield and company are found to have acted unethically, they could lose their medical licenses. In the wake of this information, 10 of the study's co-authors have withdrawn their support of its methods and conclusions. 
In fact, the overwhelming consensus in the scientific community is that there is no link between the MMR vaccine and the development of autism. This position is supported by numerous studies involving hundreds of thousands of children exposed to the vaccine. A study of all the children born in Denmark between 1991 and 1998, that's over half a million children, found no difference in rates of autism between those who were vaccinated and the 100,000 children who were not. Another study from Japan was even more shattering to Wakefield's arguments. The MMR vaccine was introduced in Japan in 1989. However, they decided to switch from the combined MMR vaccine to single vaccines in 1993. A study of over 30,000 children from Yokohama found that the rate of all autism spectrum disorders continued to rise after the combined MMR vaccine was discontinued. This is compelling evidence that the MMR vaccine is not responsible for the alarming surge in autism. This leaves us with the question of why the number of autistic children has gone up so fast in the past 20 years. There have been many suggestions, but the question is unresolved. It appears likely that changes in the diagnostic criteria, increased access to health care, and increased public awareness account for much of the surge. However, it is possible that the actual rate of autism has increased due to some unknown environmental trigger. The diagnosis for autism is based on observation of behavior. As such, it can be difficult to accurately diagnose. To be diagnosed, a child under the age of three must show at least six symptoms, including two symptoms of social impairment, one symptom of communication impairment, and one symptom of repetitive behavior. These criteria have been changed from a more restrictive, rigorous set. As a result, more children with borderline symptoms are now being classified as autistic. Also, due to the popularity of drug treatment, and an expansion of the benefits to doctors, there is more incentive to diagnose. This may lead to overdiagnosis. Also, preliminary studies have shown that children diagnosed with language impairments in previous decades would be classified as autistic today. While it is clear that there are many factors accounting for the rise in autism, we still don't know if the actual rate of the disease has changed. The shocking actions of this doctor have had negative effects well beyond the 12 children who were exploited in the study. The extensive media coverage and subsequent public outrage dropped the British rate of MMR vaccinations from 94% in 1996 to 84% in 2002. In some areas of London, the rate fell to 61%, which is much lower than the level needed to protect the entire community from measles. Not surprisingly, the rates of measles and mumps infections began to skyrocket. In 1998, there were 56 cases of measles in the UK. In 2006, there were 449 in the first five months of the year and the first death from measles since 1992. Most of the victims were non-vaccinated children. Before 1999, mumps cases were very, very rare. However, by 2005, there were 5,000 reported cases of infection in January alone. Measles and mumps infections continued to rise in 2006 at 13 and 37 times the rates seen in 1997. How did one study with an extremely small number of patients manage to persuade so many people to take risks with their children's health? Surely the media coverage was overblown, but other factors may have been at work. People have been wary of vaccines ever since they were introduced. Quite often, they cause mild symptoms of the disease as the body learns how to fight it off. This was more of a problem in the past, considering that the 14 vaccines commonly given today contain less immune-stressing compounds than a single dose of the smallpox vaccine a century ago. Still, there is a small, vocal minority of the population who believe that vaccines are harmful because they contain aluminium and mercury, that they don't work, and that they cause diseases like autism. However, these arguments have been around since vaccines were created and reflect a distrust of the mainstream medical community. In fact, many alternative health practitioners are against vaccines. A 1995 study of American chiropractors found that one-third believed that there was no proof that immunization prevents disease. However, only a small number actively advocate this position to their patients. In contrast, a study of non-medically trained homeopaths in Sydney found that 83% of them don't recommend vaccination. This is dangerous advice from people who are not qualified to determine the risks and benefits of vaccines. Since not even enormous amounts of evidence to the contrary can persuade the most ardent anti-vaccinationists, it is clear that proper communication between doctors and the community is essential to keep the level of vaccinations high enough to protect us all. In 2008, the number of unvaccinated children in England was high enough to support the continuous spread of measles for the first time in 14 years. 
If Australians don't wish to see diseases like measles become common again, they would be wise to listen to the advice of doctors who are specifically trained in areas such as infectious disease and immunology. Given that there are risks, some religions oppose vaccination, and no amount of evidence can change some minds, compliance will never reach 100%. But the closer we get, the safer we are from unleashing deadly and disabling diseases that should be distant memories. That was Martin Ficini reminding us all to be good parents and good citizens and vaccinate our children. So Martin, that was a fascinating story about vaccines. I'm a bit surprised about the homeopaths. I thought their main principle was that a little of what hurts you will protect you against what hurts you. It sounds a lot like vaccination itself, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. I can't really account for for their lack of advocation for vaccination other than their general... And this is, keep in mind, non-medically trained homeopaths because there are a small number of rheumatologists or other specialists who do um, embrace homeopathy, but they will almost certainly also endorse vaccination. The trouble comes with people who haven't received medical training in, with infectious diseases, and I can only assume that they might have a treatment for each one of these diseases in their toolkits themselves. Yes. So, but that's complete conjecture. <laughs> yes, and of course it's a real civil liberties issue, the right to not have a vaccine yourself or for your children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. You just can't have a government demanding that you inject an unknown substance into yourself. It flies in the face of everything we're we're told to to believe in as a free society. But and so the the concept of a conscientious objector was actually created in response to people's concerns over forced to become vaccinated. When was that? About two hundred years ago in England. Wow. Mm-hmm. So what was the vaccination? I believe it was for smallpox. Or it may not have been smallpox, but... Sounds right about 200 years ago. Yeah. So most likely in response to smallpox. But at the time, vaccines, it wasn't very scientific, and they did elicit a response, and you could actually get smallpox from the treatment. So lots of people were just wary of being forced to be uh, vaccinated because there were all these uh, side effects. Right. Right. But today, we don't really see such problems. It's more of a situation from just just a general distrust of, of the medical community. Some people think that their their views, their alternative health views, aren't aren't taken seriously by their doctors, mm-hmm. and so they might they might find homeop- homeopathists who can you know uh, agree with them and and support their beliefs, and it'll it'll help them in the in the short run. But they're actually putting themselves at risk. And once those vaccination levels drop below a certain threshold, then everyone becomes at risk. So that's right. That's where the, the trade off between civil liberties and the protection of the the entire public becomes a factor. <laughs> Like there's, uh, there are other examples all over the world of, of what happens when the vaccination rates drop. And one of the best examples is the, the government of Nigeria established a formal position to be wary of Western medicine in around 2004, 2005. And by 2006, um, Nigeria was accounting for half of all the polio cases in the world. Wow. Did they have a, anything happen to them that made them wary? Or was it just general paranoia? It may have just been... Uh, a, a political platform, right? Right, and you can completely understand how they could bank on that, right? Considering the things that have happened in that area, yes, <laughs> historically, right? So, and yeah, it's just really unfortunate that people could take such a position, to, and then it'll ha- it'll end up affecting so many people negatively. Like Nigeria reported twenty thousand measles cases and six hundred deaths from January through March two thousand five, and. In 2007, there was an outbreak in one of the states that killed 200 children. So it's really unfortunate, and it reflects the importance that the the vaccinations really hold uh, in keeping these diseases at bay and how vigilant you have to be. And the prime responsibility is is proper communication from from doctors to their patients because that's really the best way for people to be educated. Right, so it's communication and education. It is, yeah. It all goes back to proper empathic communication communication. I mean, you have to accept other people's beliefs, even if they're fundamentally against the scientific consensus. You have to respect the people, if exactly. not the beliefs. Right, because if you don't respect them, then they'll just go find someone who will, and they may be going to one of those 83% of Sydney homeopaths who don't recommend they vaccinate their children. So, yeah, it, it really highlights um, just the relative importance of proper communication and understanding, which is one of the cornerstones of medical education in the first place. So. That was Martin Fashini talking about vaccination, anti-vaxxers, and the MMR vaccine back in 2008. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. 
Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in North East Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's science360.gov internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website www.diffusionradio.com That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.